The path to a better life begins with a simple step. Empower Radio presents Simple Steps, Real Change with Cheryl Maloney. Empower Radio. EmpowerRadio.com. Here's your host, Cheryl Maloney. Have you ever learned the importance of loving yourself first? Or do you see that as an ego trip that makes you a bad person? Or at very least, self-absorbed? Are you looking to others around you for self-validation when the only one who can confirm your self-worth is you? Today's show is all about you and how important you are to this life. And joining me is a dear friend and regular Simple Steps Real Change contributor, award-winning author and speaker, Janet D. Thomas. She's the founder of the Heal for Real movement, and she's passionate and a founder of Operation Alive in 2040. Her vision is to end obesity on the planet by 2040. Janet, I'm so glad to have you here. Welcome to the show. Cheryl, thank you so much. As always, it's a pleasure to chat with you always. Well, and Janet, for those of you that may not be familiar with Janet, we go back a long time, and I've been grateful, and she has helped me in so many ways. But Janet, for those who don't have a background with you, tell them a little bit about your history, because you started out at a young age without a lot of support. Yes, you know, Cheryl, that's true. Um, you know, a- as a young girl, I was, uh, I-, I found myself having inappropriate experiences with men that were sexual in nature. And I just figured that it was my fault somehow that these things were happening. And what I did was I, I kept it a secret. I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell anyone. And I, I just withdrew um, from life in certain ways. And And because I was really young, I was really old, very young. I started thinking about things um, in life that that kind of stripped me of the carefree type of childhood. And I know that a lot of people um, have what I call those non-preferred experiences that do challenge them to kind of be too old too soon. You know what I mean? Yeah. I absolutely do. And you truly became an old soul through a very, and I don't... Negative is the only way to put it. I mean, your experience is the kind of thing that parents just cringe about and fear that their children would ever experience. Yeah, it's true. It's a betrayal, uh, you know, in the deepest sense of the word. And, uh, yeah, it's mortifying to have your trust, you know, betrayed in that way. And as parents, you know, to have your children violated. Yeah, it it is crazy-making. And, and, you know, that was what I call a non-preferred experience. I have since learned how to transform it from being a negative one, but that's a whole other journey in itself. (laughs) Uh, Well, and it is another journey, but you have gone from being a person that thought you were doing everything wrong to seeking a way to help others who are going through these situations where they put their power to everybody else. They think other people are responsible for their happiness. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I was a pleaser from way back. I thought that, you know, if I could only be pleasing to other people and be a good girl and do the right thing, that I would be able to fill up that hole that was inside of me. It, it just was like a, just a, a loneliness and a sense of separation and a true sense of of really not feeling good enough at all. I mean, I really thought that I was inherently evil or else those things wouldn't have happened to me. And then other things like the depression and the obesity and the compulsive lying and things as a result of that and other non-preferred experiences like rape as an adult. I mean, all of these things just, just really solidified for me this idea that I wasn't good enough. And... The journey for me has been about, and I've been voracious about reading things and learning ideas and, and, and finding ways to heal myself because I knew that I just, I was really wounded and I, I wanted to be happy. I wanted to be optimistic. I always felt like underneath my stuff, you know, I was an optimistic person. I was a helpful person. I was a kind person, but I, I was in such hell 
And I, I really sought to, to heal myself. And after decades of trying different things and studying and reading, and I, and I found a way to do it. And, and I just feel this still feels so amazing. I can't even tell you. Well, to know, despite everything that you were through, and non-preferred, I think, is a gentle way of putting this, but it also, yeah. it also helps in a lot of ways to diffuse the horrific negativity of what you experienced. At what point did you actually realize that your self-worth was not tied up with everything that had happened to you? Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's such a great question. I have to tell you, Cheryl, when I, you know, after, after I was raped as an adult and I, and I, and I re I hit rock bottom about six months after that, I'd held on for as long as I could. And then I just thought, my goodness, I can't stick around here because the pain is just too great. And, um, breaking down like that was a wonderful breakthrough for me because I, because it, oh, I was finally open to new ideas and to trying things in a different way because what I had been doing wasn't working because I, I felt more horrible than ever. So that breakthrough allowed me to open my mind to uh, consider new ideas, to consider something different. And this is what happened. To answer your question, at that point when I was clinging to life by a thread, and, and so, many, so many of us know what that's like, mm-hmm. um, I, 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 I pulled back from looking for validation from other people and things and, you know, a new car or the right clothes or losing 20 pounds. I, I withdrew myself uh, internally from the world in that way. And then I did what I couldn't do before that. I didn't have the courage to face myself and look within and tell myself the truth and, and really learn how to navigate my inner uh, my inner demons, really. And the first thing that I did, actually, looking back in hindsight, is I became defiant. And, and let me just define that. Like, defiance is simply uh, defined as a bold, daring, or courageous rejection of authority. So for me, that was new territory where I rejected authority uh, from other people telling me what's true for me. And I had to go inside and, and, and really work with myself to determine what my truth was, how I felt about things. And don't get me wrong, I still followed directions. I still stopped at stop signs. I was still a good citizen in the world. But, but, but on the inside, I really shut it down to understand who I was without all of the other ideas of what is acceptable. And through that defiance, I came to the point where I was acceptable to myself. And I understood that those um, experiences that I had were not connected to my value and my worth. They were certainly things that happened in my life that I needed to process out, that I needed to grieve and heal from. But they weren't connected to my value, and that's where I went wrong when I was little, or that's what I did. I I, I decided that I wasn't a good person because those things happened, but that wasn't true at all. I was still a very good person, and I had those situations that weren't weren't, uh, good, you know? Well, how did the people that were you were around you at that time, your family and friends, when you got to this point of realizing you were going to be that defiant person, how did they all react to that? Because it sounds like before that you were just doing whatever someone else wanted you to do. Yeah, I, you know, I didn't announce that I was going to be defiant. I didn't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> One of the things that was really interesting that really saved me in a lot of ways, Cheryl, is that when I was younger, I, 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 I didn't really, I acted out in certain ways, but I wasn't announcing it. There, I, was, I lived inside of myself so much that I never let people know what was going on with me. So it just still stayed in that way where I didn't let people know what I was doing because it really wasn't about them. I, I kept everything else just kind of, I kept everything else stable. I still looked like everything was fine, um, but I just shut it down on the inside. And uh, as I started to shift, um, other people 
noticed along the way that I was, I was, I, I don't know, I was happier. I was, but I, I didn't butt heads with anyone else externally because it really wasn't about them anyway. It's about, it was about you. Did you get to a point where you told your parents what had happened to you? Yes, actually, I did. I told them about it um, before I, I had my breakdown. They knew about it um, a few years before I, a few years before I almost left the planet because I was still pretending like I was okay. I mean, I let them know, you yeah, know, I'm fine. I, you know, I just never, wa- I always wanted to protect other people. I didn't want to see anyone else go through any pain or any sorrow or anything like that. So I was still pretending like I was okay. <sighs> but your parents had to have been heartbroken. Completely. Completely. And to this day, it can still be challenging. Um, you know, for my father, he says that he was able to make somewhat peace with it to the extent someone can, which of course is, is, is feels impossible to do. But he said, because you're doing so well, because you are so whole now, you know, he, he, I guess in a way he's kind of able even to forgive himself. Um, it's still, it's still hard and it's still hard for my mother to, uh, it's, Feel very very hard for her. I know it would be for me if it were my sure. if it were my son. I know it would be really hard for me. But I but what I have found, Cheryl, really is that I'm not who I am in spite of those experiences. I am who I am because of them. They have in the ability to encounter hardship, the ability to overcome hardship, and understand our strength and our value and respect for ourselves in the midst of hardship is, um, is incredibly enriching. And, and, and because I am where I am right now, Cheryl, I know it's a result of having gone through so much pain. Like Khalil Gibran said, he's one of my favorite poets. He said, the deeper sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. It, and that philosophy, and you and I share that because as, as many difficult experiences, challenging, non-optimal, whatever you want to call them, this life isn't perfect. We don't come into right. here and everything is perfect and organized and it's all as it needs to be. Otherwise, why the heck come? There wouldn't be anything, any purpose for being here. So all of these experiences that you've had have made you the person that you are today. And Janet, you are probably one of the most inspiring people I have ever met in this sense of, I'm going to make something better better of all of this because that's why I'm on this planet that is truly self-love because you have come Mm. to appreciate yourself and your own self-worth yes and thank you for that Cheryl I'm truly honored um and and yeah I think that it is a it's a it's a growth opportunity being here you know and and I I think it's important to look outside of the box you know to to kind of open up the imagination and look beyond the physical and go what is this all about? Well, I started doing that when I was a little girl anyway. Like, what <laughs> is this? You know what I mean? Even those initial ones, like, I, I have to go to school every day? What is this? You know, <laughs> when you start learning the rules, you know, and, and, and trying to make sense out of them. And, and, and in my own thirst and my desire to make sense out of things, um, I've opened up my mind a tremendous amount. And, and the amount of love that's there to me the, the, the challenge is, gee, how much bigger can I make my ability to love? How can I get out of my comfort zone to, let me see if I could say this right. How do I get out of my comfort zone enough to embrace experiences that feel like they aren't love? How can I include those in the, under the umbrella of love? And, well, and that's kind um, of the quest. But that's a big, I mean, that's a big one. That's a big one because as we sit there and look at, and you went through the worst life has to offer. And, you know, even when you talk about leaving this planet, you weren't in a place where you loved yourself, but your inner strength said, I have to figure out a way to make this 
a more positive experience in my life. So tell the audience, because we're alluding to it here, but at this point, you truly didn't want to live any longer. No, I didn't. I was, I literally, and I contemplated that for many years, ever since I was little. I thought about the idea of not being here, and I do have kind of a a love affair with the idea of death. I always have. But... Uh, at this point in time, I was, I was truly, honestly, I was already, I was clinically depressed. I was already on antidepressants. Like, you know, I get raped and then six months, I couldn't do it anymore, but I really was on the edge. But what happened was my, my husband, my ex-husband was still one of my dearest friends at the time. He, he made me see that my mother and our son would never recover if I did that. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't going to do that the people who I loved the most. I mean, it's like, I didn't think my life was worth anything, but I knew that theirs was. And, and that's the only reason why I stayed. So when I talk about the idea of almost leaving the planet and I, and I tell people, you know, please stick around because someone will miss you. Someone is never going to recover if you leave. And you may not even have met them yet, but somebody needs you to stay here. So please, amidst the pain, in spite of all of that, please stick around and breathe through it. It, it can yeah. get way better. You would miss the biggest comeback in history if you left. Well, and you truly have made it. And your mission, and you call it Heal for Real, which I absolutely love. Tell the audience a little bit about how you came to healing for real as opposed to just going through the motions of a day. Yeah, thank you for that, Cheryl. And it's just so nice to talk to you. This is always <laughs> so fun. It's always so fun. I love it too, um, Janet. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, Heal for Real, I know what it's like to be I know what it's like to pretend to be okay because I did that for so long and I always yearned for, like I would see people who just had this spark or this, 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 this way about them that was so warm and comforting and they just felt so good in their skin. It seemed like they were really, they really had their, their, their act together. And I always admired that. And I was like, what would that feel like for me? And, and I just, you know, healing for real, was a journey that I took that I looked back in retrospect and said, yeah, this for me, I found not the way to heal for real, but a way to heal for real, because there are many different ways to do it. But my way was to become defiant, to, to not look to authority figures or the outside world for my validation, but I had to start telling myself the truth, release judgment on all the things that I had done and all of the things that I, that I, disagreed with on my behavior and my actions all those years. I honored what I needed to do to survive. But the most important thing that I did, Cheryl, was all of the stuff that I kept inside all of those years, I started to release it safely with harm to none, including myself. I started to cry. I started to express myself. I started to verbalize what was going on within my body because I held on to all this trauma all those years. Like I get impacted by something and I pretend like I was okay, but it was all, it was still in my body and it was still wreaking havoc on my Mm -hmm. mind and my heart and my soul. And I finally had to go in there and I faced the pain and I released the pain safely. And as I started to do that, that's when the clouds that I'd lived under my whole life started to shift and started to kind of dissipate and that's when I made the connection that we hold on to stuff we're taught not to be emotional we're taught to just put on a brave face but I needed to be in a safe place where I can let that stuff out safely and as I continued to Mm. do that slowly I started to get better and that's the connection that I made and this message I think is so vital and I'm so glad that this is something that you say it's because we take everything and we internalize it. And we think we've got to be these tough people, but the longer we suppress it inside us, one, it pops out when we least expect it and least need it to, but it eats us apart. Or, you know, like some of us, and you understand this, we eat our problems. We literally eat thinking that's going to, you know, make our problems better, which, okay, it only makes them worse, but we don't know that at the time. Yeah, we're doing the best we can. I mean, we, we, we you know, it, food was my drug of choice, but, you know, we have different ways to distract ourselves. It could be, you know, drugs or shopping or sex or, 
you know, um, a lot of different, a lot of different ways that we comfort ourselves and just try to take a time out from, from, from the challenges in life. And also from our own sadness, from our own, you know, we, we don't give that a voice. And, and, you know, we're taught not to give that a voice. That's kind of what we do in our society, you know, and, and as we hear when we're little, you know, don't cry. And, you know, there's a place for that, for being expressive that way. And we're born that way. Like, as an example, if you see a three-year-old running down the street and then they fall, what do they do? They might cry. But what happens in, like, 20 or 30 seconds? What happens? They're back to running. They're like, oh, I'm over it. I'm done with it. Let's keep it moving. (laughs) You know? And we, you know, it's just such an interesting point because for anybody that's listening to the show, we can all sit back here and say, yeah, I remember when I didn't, you know, admit to how I truly felt. I just hid it inside. And when we take that and connect it, we realize when we're eating or, you know, medicating ourselves in some way, the truth of the matter is we think that we are helping ourselves, but instead we're just making it worse, but we're not in a place where we can see that. And you have seen that. And that's why it's been your mission to help people heal for real. So I... It's a great conversation to have today. (laughs) You know, thank you so much. And and I have to tell you, that's the key for me when it comes to this discussion about self-love. To me, it's and and it is a a simple step that that does create real change. The simple step when it comes to self-love is making a place in your inner world that's inviting, that's always nice to go home to. Having a place within yourself where you can go and be comforted, where you can go and get support. And this is an inner world um, phenomenon. It's something that can happen. And, you know, science is now validating the, um, the importance and the, the effectiveness of going into our imaginations and into our inner world of, uh, to be able to reduce stress and to heal emotionally and, and even physically. So this is kind of a newer frontier that we're getting validation about. But when we find a place within ourselves where we, where we have an inner nurturer, a part of us that comforts the other part, like the part that is sorrowful and you have another part that says, I hear you and I'm with you and let it out. It's okay. You're safe. And to have that inner nurturer, Speak, give that a voice as we do our critic, because, you know, our critic exists. But to give our inner nurturer, give that, um, that warm support the voice as well. And that equates to self-love. And I like that philosophy because, like you say, we, we hear the inner critic all the time. But it's time to start listening to that voice that is filled with kindness and compassion for ourselves. Because after all, we're responsible for ourselves. No one else is going to save us. That's not what we're here for. We're here to discover ourselves. And I just love the way you put that. And it's like, how do we nurture ourselves? But you know what, Janet, we're going to get into a whole other show about that because we're almost out of time. Oh, that's great. That's I know great. it just it just flies through. Well, before I let you go, tell everyone yes. where to find Janet D. Thomas besides on Simple Steps Real Change because you publish with me every month. So tell them how to find more about you, and especially where are they going to find out more about the 2040 plans you have? That one just really oh. amazes me. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, you, JanetDThomas.com. And also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, uh, Lemons, Lemonade, and Life is the page on Facebook, which is the name of uh, my book. And uh, Operation in Life in 2040, the vision is to end obesity on the planet by year 2040. Uh, Getting off the ground that this year, that's at uh, oe2040.com. It points to the Facebook page right now uh, until we get the website going and the community started. And I just I'm really on fire about that vision. 
Well, we're going to share that vision more on the next show. Janet, thanks for being with us today and for sharing the audience your journey and your wisdom about how we can listen to that inner nurturing voice and get back to loving ourselves, which is what we really need to do. Thank you so much. You've just you've made this day wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thanks for being here with my guest, Janet D. Thomas from Heal for Real. And, you know, it is about loving yourself and that's not self-indulgent. You have to love yourself first before you can really enjoy this life. So join us again next time. And until then, have a wonderful week and may all of your simple steps lead to real change. 